Hello, my front porch friend. Well, spring has finally arrived in the valley, and I don't think anybody is happier about that than I am. I was walking through the pasture just now, and uh, I spotted something I have to show you. It is right here. In fact, I hope I can get my camera down here so you can see what I'm talking about. You see these beautiful little purple flowers? Now, I don't know what they're called. In fact, if you do know what they're called, please comment below and tell me because every spring about this time, I always look for these little flowers. And when I see them, they make me smile. It's just like the buttercups. They're kind of sitting there like a beautiful promise that better days are coming. And I tell you what, after a week like we have all just experienced, I think we need to hear that, don't we? So can I just declare that over your life today? And is it just prophetically declaring it over you, your family, this nation, I believe better days are coming. I believe that because I believe the Word of God, and we're going to talk about that today. But before we do, I want to show you something I'm working on. I think you can sort of see it in the background right there. So it's not complete. We've got a long way to go. But on my property is this old cabin that uh, was actually when my grandfather bought this property long before I was ever born. This was the only thing here on the property was this old cabin. And my grandfather actually lived in it with my mom when she was a baby girl. Of course, they're for whole family. And uh, until they built their house down there, which, of course, is where we usually are, somewhere down in there by the creek. But up here on the higher, land, on the higher ground, <coughs> they, have, they have studied this cabin. Some, we had some men come out and look at it, and they have estimated it to uh, have been built around the mid-1800s right before the Civil War, at least this part of it is. Now that part down there was a little newer, but this, this part, if you could see it, oh, these logs, they are just so beautiful. This, if, when the sun is shining on them, you can see where the man that originally cut them down, you can still see his ax marks that have been left in the wood. And uh, we actually have the old original door that goes here, but obviously we've got it down because we're working. But in, inside, we've torn out the floor because we'll have to put it back. And uh, we're going to put back the old original fireplace with the rocks that originally go there. And oh my, it's just going to be so fun. I can't wait for you to see it when it's finished. I wish you could come in person because I want to fix it back so we can cook some beans again on the old fireplace. Because that swing thing that comes out, you know, that holds the... Um, that old cast iron pot that the women used to cook their food in, it's still there. And uh, I wanna fix it where we can cook, cook food again and cook and put up my grandmother's old wood stove that I have and hook it back up. And anyway, just all kinds of, I dream all the time, but it's fun. And I like to come out here sometimes and just sit and be, and just remember the old days gone by. And uh, it's sort of good for you in times like these. Can you believe how much things can change in just a week. My, my, just since you and I were together last week, it almost feels like our world's about turned upside down a little bit, hasn't it? But I have a word that the Lord's been laying on my heart these last few days, and it's just helped me. And I believe that it will, if you will hear this word, it will help you navigate through and respond rightly to these unprecedented times that we're living in. This is, um, it's a familiar verse, two verses, very familiar verses, but I want you to hear them today with fresh ears so we can hear what the Spirit is saying to us, all right? The first verse is found in Romans 8, 28, and it just simply says this. You know it. It says, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, I love that because he makes it clear exactly who he's talking to. He makes it clear that he's talking to people who love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, <coughs> I know you love God. I love God. So you and I can claim that that verse, the promise that is found in that verse is ours. That all things are working together. Just that word, that little three letter word, all, all things are working together for good. All things in my life. I mean, every detail. Psalms 23 no, Psalms 37, verse 23, I love it. It says this. It says, 
It says the Lord directs the steps of the righteous and he delights in every detail of our lives. He's more concerned. He is more involved in the details of our lives than we are. I believe that. He delights in the details of our lives. He is working all things together for good. The things we understand and the things we do not understand. All things are being worked together for good. Because you love God. I was dealing with a situation just a few days ago that I was thinking, God, why am I dealing with this? Why is this even going on? Because this looks like the work of the enemy in these relationships and this stuff. It's just stirred up. And what is happening? It was like I heard the Lord say to me because I'm answering your prayers. Because you prayed about this situation and you've been praying that it would look like this. But before it can look like this, we're going to have to deal with this. And you're right. He's, he said, Karen, it is the enemy. And, and this thing where the enemy has been rooted, it's going to have to be exposed and uprooted and cast out before this thing can ever look like what you prayed for it to look like. So you know what we got to trust in, hon? We've got to believe God today, my dear friend, that even when we can't see it, he's working. And even when we can't feel it, he's working. He is working all things in our lives when it makes no sense. But our father loves us enough. He can take the mess and turn it around for good. Now, this next verse that's been alive to me lately is so good. I'm probably going to have to just go over here and read it to you because I brought my Bible. It's found in the book of James. I've been in the book of James for days. The whole book is outstanding. But this verse has such life on it for us right now. Let me look it up. James, I'd love for you to follow along with me. So I'm going to see, see if I can hold my Bible where you can read it with me. It's in James, the first chapter, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Okay? And it says this, chapter 1, verse 2. Can you see that? I hope so. It says, dear brothers and sisters, right there, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. My friend, that is... That's so loaded. That verse, it's, it's like one of the most audacious verses in the Bible. That James is making such a bold claim that when your endurance is fully developed, you're going to be perfect and complete. You won't even need anything. What in the world? Well, how do you get endurance? I want to know too. Well, I believe we can, I, he can tell you. He's telling you here, it's going to come through the soil of trouble. And <laughs> you think... It's not what I want to hear. Is there another way? No. No, there isn't. He's saying here, when, when you are dealing, the King James says, don't even think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that has come to try you. Paul, James is saying here, when these troubles are coming, he says, when your faith is tested, your endurance is growing. You know what? I think it's Bob Sorge maybe that said this. Endurance, what is it? It is faith sustained or sustained faith in the fiery trial. It's like when you just won't let go. You just will not stop believing or throw down your faith. You just won't do it. That is sustained faith through the fiery trial is creating in you an endurance. And when you build, and that's why he says, when you have endurance, let it grow. Let your endurance grow because when, you're, when your endurance is mature and complete, you're going to be perfect. You won't even need anything. <laughs> is that even possible? Yes, because I found this little secret when I was reading this. This week, it was in Philippians. He's the kind of the only man I ever known, besides Jesus, of course, who really operated in finding this place. And it was in, in, the, in Philippians, it's Paul. 
Paul had been through so many fiery trials. His endurance had been tested so severely that Paul finally just says in the fourth chapter of Philippians, let's see, down about the, let me get my glasses on. I'm sorry for this camera work. Hang on. It's down about the 11th verse. Paul says here, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content. With whatever I have. Paul said, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. He said, I have learned the secret of living. This is so good. In every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty one, whether it's with plenty or with little, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4, verses like uh, 12 and 13. I have learned the secret of living. He said, in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or with an empty one, plenty or little, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. In verse 18, he says down here, at the moment, I have all I need. I don't even need anything. Paul, what in the world? He's saying here, his, his endurance had been so developed and, and his faith had been so sustained. And it had been because the second chapter of Timothy, he tells Timothy, Timothy, I kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I've held on to my faith. And at the end of his life, he's saying, you know what? I don't even need anything. I've just learned. I've learned the secret of living is to be content, whether you've got a lot or whether you've got a little. Because he says, you know why? I've learned that, that all of my strength is coming from him. He said, I have learned that all that I need, my God supplies all of my needs. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a man whose endurance has been developed. You say, Paul, how did you learn that? I'll tell you how he learned it. In what James said. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. Paul, how did you learn that? Paul learned to find joy in his trouble. How did you learn to find joy in your trouble, Paul? He learned to make trouble an opportunity. And that's what I want to encourage you today in our nation, and in our lives because we've all been affected by this trouble that has come our way in this virus. But you know what I'm, I want to ask you to do with me? Let's take this trouble and make it an opportunity, like he is saying here. When troubles come your way, make it, he says here exactly, see it as an opportunity. To, I want to ask you to do two things, an opportunity for two things. Number one, an opportunity to find God in it. Just say to God, God, where are you in this trouble? Where are you in this situation? I learned that when Lindsay was gone. And I've shared that with you where you just say, God, I've heard what everybody else has to say. I've heard what Fox News has to say, CNN News has to say, everybody in my city, what they've all, I've heard what everybody's had to say about this virus and about everything we're dealing with. God, what do you have to say? about this situation. Maybe it's even in your family, your children, your finances. God, I, I know what everybody, I know what the circumstances themselves have to say. What do you have to say? God, where are you in this? It's okay to ask God some questions. I know some people say, well, you shouldn't question God. <laughs> people that say that, I don't even know how... I've questioned if they've served God very long. Because I ask, I ask God a lot of questions. I think all learning children ask questions. And one of the main questions I have asked in my life over and over is, God, where are you? Where are you? I asked that a lot when Lindsay was gone. Why and where are you? And he told me one day, he asked that himself one time Jesus did on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? In other words, Jesus was even saying, why and where are you? And you know, I want you to know, I don't ask God where he is because I'm angry with him. And that's important. You can ask questions if you ask with the right heart. I never, we don't ask God questions because we accuse him. I'm not asking God, where are you? Because I think he's lost. I'm not asking God, where are you? Because I'm angry with him or that, you know, 
I'm asking God or, or because I don't believe him. I'm asking you where you are because I do believe you. Because he has promised, our father has promised us, I will never leave you or forsake you. He promised us that. So I'm asking you where you are because I believe that. I believe that you will never leave us or forsake us. So God, in this situation, where are you? Listen, his presence is everything. It's, it is good to know. I have to know where he is. I'm like a little child sometimes in the dark. When I was a little girl, I remember sometimes in our bedroom, our bedroom was right next to my mom, mom and daddy's bedroom, just a wall between us. And I remember laying in my little tiny blue bedroom at night and the lights were out and it was dark and I couldn't see anything. And sometimes when I was laying there in the dark, I would just say, daddy, daddy. And I'd keep saying it louder until they woke him up. Daddy. And laying in there in the dark, I would listen for his voice. And as soon as my daddy would say, I'm here. I'm here. That's all I needed to know. It didn't matter that it was dark. It didn't matter if I was afraid. As long as I could just hear his voice. I'm here. Because I knew my daddy would take care of anything. Well, right now where you are, it may seem dark and you're afraid. And you're uncertain about tomorrow. But all you have to do is you just cry out for your Abba Father. God, where are you in this? And you know what you're going to hear? Those two words. I'm here. I'm here in the midst of this. Because I'm going to tell you something, my friend. Those Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel found out where he was. When they were facing trouble, you talk about consider it trouble, when, consider it an opportunity for joy when trouble comes your way. The Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were three young men that were facing trouble. They had done what was right. They had stood up for God and their faith by not bowing to the idol, which was going to result in them being cast into a, a, a fiery furnace. You know the story. And so the King Nebuchadnezzar looks at those, those Hebrew boys. And I mean, he, I love it. And I can't remember which verse it is, but he tells them, he says, look, I'm going to give you one more chance because obviously you didn't understand the rules. And I love the Hebrew boys' response. They said, oh, King, we don't need to defend ourselves in this matter. They said, our God that we serve is able to deliver us from the fire. He said, in fact, they said, in fact, he will deliver us. And then watch this. Then they said, but if he does not, we still will not bow to your idol. <laughs> Listen, when you are able to say, our God is able to deliver us out of this trouble. But if he does not deliver us, I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to worship him anyway. If God doesn't deliver me, I know him so well. He can be trusted so much. I believe in him so much. I'm still going to worship him. When you can say that, honey, you are the devil's worst nightmare. You can't be stopped when, you're the, when you have the kind of faith that's so sustained through a fiery trial that says he can deliver me and he may deliver me. And he will, but, he, but even if he doesn't, I'm worshiping. I'm praising him. You know what they found out? Their enemy was so angry. The Bible said he was, Nebuchadnezzar was so angry, his face contorted. He said, then take the trouble and make it seven times worse. Take the fire and make it seven times hotter. And the Bible says they threw them into the fire with their clothes on and their, hat, their turbans wrapped around their heads. And they were tied up and they were thrown into the fire. But when they got in the fire, Oh, as a child, I loved this part. Nebuchadnezzar jumps up and he looks at his men and he says, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Didn't we just cast three men into this fire? Because I'm looking in here and I see four men. I see four men and they're walking around. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you. Right now, he calls them out. And when they come out, the only thing burned are the ropes that was holding them. My friend, where is God? 
He is with us. He is with us in the situation. Where is God? He is with us in the fire, just like he was the Hebrew boys. Where is God for you right now? You need to look around in your trouble and consider it an opportunity to find God. One more thing I've got to tell you before we go. When I was asking God this week, where are you? Where are you? I knew he answered me. I'm here. I'm with you. Then the second thing was, I saw him. I saw him in the trouble, even in the trouble our nation is facing. But as I saw him, I saw him in the doctors and the nurses that are taking care of the sick. I saw him standing in rooms in Italy and in China and other nations and in our own country, standing beside the bedside of those that are afraid and alone and scared. I saw him with people that are fighting the situation that we're in. And yet they didn't even know he was in the room. They don't know his presence. They don't know who he is. They don't know how to recognize him. And that's where you and I come in. I believe today in this, in this trouble that we are facing, we can consider it an opportunity to show the world who he is and where he is. Because our God, remember, so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. And he still loves the world. He loves the people that are sick in, in, in China and in, and in Italy and, and in Spain and in all these nations that are fighting this horrible sickness. He is there. God is not looking at the world right now going, yeah, they deserve this. God's not looking at our world today, looking down at, at whatever this, this epidemic is, that this, this pandemic is that we're, that we're dealing with. He's not looking at this going, yeah, they deserve this for what they've done. No, you know what? I believe his heart is grieved because it is still his love that causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. No, God loves people. And when God saw in Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter, whenever Israel had sinned and they were reaping destruction and death, you know what God did? When he saw, look down and he sees Israel that they're about to be destroyed. You know what he did? He starts looking. He says, so I searched for a man. I started looking for somebody that would pray. When God sees a need, he looks for a man. So in this trouble, a man that will pray, a man that will help. So in this trouble that we're facing in our nation, I want to call on you to use it as an opportunity to help people. You say, well, what do I do? How do I help people? It, this, this looks so huge. It's overwhelming. The, the problem itself, this global pandemic of this virus, I don't even know where to begin. Just begin right where you are. Just begin right at home. You know, he never called anybody but Jesus to save the world. But he did call us to love our neighbor. So you can just start right where you are. Check on your neighbor across the street. Check on the older people in your, in your city. Why don't you start by doing what, what Paul said in the first chapter of Timothy, or the first, I mean, in first Timothy. I believe it's about the third or fourth chapter you can find it. He said, he said, for the church to take care of the widows. He said, but if they don't, if, he said, but, he said, if they have children or grandchildren, let them take care of their mother and their grandmother. And Paul said, it should be their first responsibility to see to their mothers and their grandmothers that are widows. He said, this is well-pleasing to God for you to take care of your mother and grandmother. Where do we start in this global problem? Start with your mother, start with your grandmother, Start with your neighbor across the street. I'm going to close with this today. I'm sorry I've gone over our time a little bit. I hope you're still listening. This is an old, this is a familiar little story that I believe today, it spoke to me today, and I believe it will speak to us. One day a man was walking along the beach when he noticed a boy picking up something and throwing it into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, What are you doing? The boy replied, throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf is up and the tide is going out, and if I don't throw these back, they'll die. Son, the man said, don't you realize there's miles and miles of beach and hundreds of starfish? You can't make a difference. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, and threw it back into the surf. 
And then smiling at the man, he said, I made a difference for that one. My friend, you can make a difference. You can make a difference by loving the people closest to you. Father, I pray for my friend today that in this time, they will find an opportunity in the trouble that we have found ourselves in, an opportunity to see you, hear you, and know you, and see you. I pray we will find in this place an opportunity to represent you to a world that's afraid. And my friend, as I was praying, as even though the video turned off accidentally, I just want you to continue to pray and finish that prayer for me, not just by words, but by action and walking and living this out. So he is with us today and we're going to find in this trouble an opportunity to see God and find great joy. So comment below. I really, really would love to hear from you and find out what your prayer needs are at this moment or share in your praise reports. And um, I know that I've gone over our normal time, but I believe that these are unusual times. And so it's important that we can be together and stand in agreement in prayer. I love you, my friend. It's going to be all right. There are better days ahead. But in this day, we find him in Jesus' name. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.